Hello, my name is William Rigby. I'm from Dartmouth Medical School, and I'm here to talk to you about B and T cell directed therapy for rheumatoid arthritis and the newest results from the ULR 2011 meeting. The learning objectives of today's presentation are to provide you with insight into the most recently presented clinical data regarding the usage of D and T cell directed therapies in rheumatoid arthritis and current approaches associated with these therapies. Shown on this slide is a schematic of the inflammatory cascade that's thought to operate in the synovium of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And we are going to focus on the upper left-hand corner with the T-cell, providing the production of BAF, or B-cell activating factor, which leads to B-cell proliferation and clonal expansion, as well as the T-cell production of IL-17 uh, and the activation of macrophages and synoviocytes. In these models that are going to be tested in the clinical trials we discussed today, we're going to either block the cytokines, such as BAF or IL-17, or we're going to explore the activity of antibodies directed against B cells and their efficacy in rheumatoid arthritis. In our program overview, we're going to first uh, review the safety data with rituximab, which is the only B cell-directed therapy uh, that's currently on the marketplace. And the second thing is that we're going to use, uh, then review the update on new B-cell targeting agents, as well as uh, an update on new IL-17 targeting in rheumatoid arthritis and assessments of their efficacy and safety. When we talk about B-cell and T-cell targeting in rheumatoid arthritis, the upper panel shows the three antibodies that are currently being uh, actively studied in rheumatoid arthritis, or have been actively studied in rheumatoid arthritis. The first antibody on the left-hand side is a chimeric antibody, rituximab. It's directed against CD20, which is on all B cells. The antibody in the middle, under showing humanized, is ocrelizumab, which is less immunogenic and less likely to develop autoantibodies. And that's no longer being studied in rheumatoid arthritis. That's being studied in multiple sclerosis, so we will not talk about that today. The third antibody is a novel antibody because it's fully human. And that's uh, the first fully human antibody to be studied in rheumatoid arthritis. And that's ofatumumab, at least the first anti-CD20 that's fully human. Now, ofatumumab has the property of being optimized for its ability to kill B cells through complement-dependent cytotoxicity, or CDC, shown in the, uh, the box to the right. So we will be reviewing the uh, new data with ofatumumab. But in addition, we're going to review uh, two other antibodies. One is called anti-BAF, LY2127399, which is similar to belimumab, which is an antibody to soluble BAF, or BLIS. Now, in contrast, this molecule, this antibody, reacts with transmembrane and soluble forms of BAF, or BLIS. So it has a slightly different uh, pattern of reactivity. The second antibody we're going to talk about is an antibody to IL-17A, and this antibody is going to be called secukinumab, and we will review the, uh, the efficacy and safety data of these two antibodies in rheumatoid arthritis as well. Now, in terms of updated safety data the, uh, with rituximab, the data with rituximab is now in uh, uh, nearly 12,000 patient years of follow-up in terms of the all-exposed population. And the adverse events per 100 patient years are shown in the following table. As you can see, as you scroll across looking for the all-exposed population in the first column in the, and the patients have been treated greater than five years in the second column, and the placebo patients from the placebo arms of the clinical trials that uh, all these rituximab patients existed in is shown in the far right-hand column. And what you can see is that the adverse events, the serious adverse events, SAEs, Infections and serious infectious events, SIEs, really do not change as you scroll across with your eyes. In fact, there's been no evidence that there's any increasing safety signal with rituximab in these long-term follow-ups. There's been no increase in infections. There's been no increase in malignancy. There's been no increase in cardiovascular disease. And we're now up to 19 courses. Now, there have also been cases of uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, also known as PML, occurring in five patients treated with rituximab. 
And that number has stayed constant over the last year, and now it's still five cases out of greater than 130,000 patients treated, you know, giving a relative risk, uh, an incidence of one per every 26,000 patients treated, a very low risk. Now, one of the interesting studies that came out of the ULAR meeting is the Sundial 2 trial. And this is a trial that was mandated by the FDA when rituximab was approved for rheumatoid arthritis. The FDA wanted to know whether rituximab, when used or coupled with another biologic, was safe or whether it was dangerous. So in this trial, 176 patients were given rituximab, 500 milligrams, in two doses. And these patients were unique in that they were kept on their abatacept, 15%, or their TNF antagonist, 85% of these patients. And they were maintained on that for up to one year. And this is the 24-week safety data. The 24-week safety data showed 3.8 serious infections per 100 patient years. Now, what's interesting about this number is how low it is. It's essentially identical to the numbers of serious infection rates in the long-term extension trials. Moreover, it's much lower than was seen in combined therapy uh, with biologics that have been previously employed. When etanercept and anakinra therapy were coupled, there was a 7.4% serious infection rate versus 0% with etanercept alone at 24 weeks in a previous RA clinical trial. In a second RA clinical trial, etanercept was coupled with abatacept, and the serious infection rate was 5.8% versus 2.6% with etanercept at one year. In contrast, uh, the 3.8% percent serious infection rate that was seen in the Sundial trial at 24 weeks is, is just as low as seen in the long-term clinical extension trial and is actually lower than what was seen in the reflex trial where a serious infection rate of 5.2 percent was seen. Now, although this was not a trial designed to look at efficacy, these patients who were being treated with rituximab in addition to their current biologic were not doing that well on their current biologic. And therefore, that indicated their interest in being uh, going on to rituximab therapy. And what was interesting is that 52% of these patients uh, experienced ULAR moderate to good responses. And that 52% was seen in a patient population that was 60% seropositive. And the reason for this we, uh, we know is important is because we know that patients with seropositive rheumatoid arthritis tend to respond uh, uh, more, be uh, more completely or on a percentage basis more frequently than patients with seronegative RA. So it looked like, even though not selected for seropositive disease, a significant clinical improvement was seen. Therefore, we have to conclude from these data that rituximab seems to have a different uh, pattern of toxicity than uh, seen with other com when combined with other biologics than other previous combinations that have been studied. And I think the major take-home clinical point here uh, for the practitioner is that this data indicates that since the combined therapy is not associated with increased rates of infection, when you decide that a patient is failing a TNF antagonist or failing a batacept or failing some other biologic, you needn't uh, wash that patient out before you give that patient rituximab. You can just give that patient rituximab right away. Now, another, another uh, interesting observational trial came out of the Leeds group in London in the United Kingdom where they looked at uh, the safety of rituximab in rheumatoid arthritis-associated lung disease. These individuals became very interested in this because of the fact that so many uh, patients with pre-existing lung disease had side effects from TNF antagonists, specifically exacerbations of their lung disease and or entirely new processes, including granulomatous reactions. So what they did is they studied their 67 patients with established lung disease who had been given rituximab, and they had 173.5 patient years of follow-up. So this is an observational cohort. Of those 67 patients, 48 uh, had interstitial lung disease, 14 had COPD, and 5 had bronchiectasis. And these patients were followed for those 173 patient years, uh, on average about two years of follow-up. And what you can see is that there were three serious infections, which is a relatively low number, uh, given patients these with pre-existing lung disease. And there were three deaths. Uh, only one of it which can possibly be attributed to rituximab. That is, there was one suicide, one infection one year after his third rituximab course, and one case where 
uh, there was worsening interstitial lung disease with pneumonia after the first rituximab force. And this led the uh, presenter to uh, uh, discuss the fact that he feels that rituximab might be particularly safe in the context of patients with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and coexistent lung, lung disease. Now, I've reviewed the safety data with rituximab, and now I'm going to talk about and give you an update on some B-cell targeting agents. And what I'm going to start with is ofatumumab. Now, ofatumumab, as I told you earlier, was a is the fully human anti-CD20 antibody that's been optimized to kill through complement-dependent cytotoxicity, although it probably deletes B cells in other ways as well. And it was studied in a phase three trial in a methotrexate inadequate responder population. And they, in this trial, the premedications that were used were identical to that used for rituximab, that is uh, uh, Benadryl or uh, diphenhydramine, or antihistamine, plus intravenous methylprednisolone. And 130 patients were placed in each arm. And you can see that ofatumumab yielded an ACR20 of 50% uh, relative to 27% in the placebo and 67% ULR moderate to good response relative to the placebo 41%, which are certainly respectable results. The striking thing was under the infusion reactions that 68% of the patients with alpha, treated with ofatumumab had infusion reactions. This is an extraordinarily high number and much higher than the rituximab clinical trial data in the DANCER protocol, where infusion reactions were seen in the, at a much lower frequency, I think in the 15 to 20% range in the first infusion. 21% of the patients experienced rash, 16% uh, experienced urticaria, and nearly all of them were at the first infusion. So it looks like ofatumumab is like rituximab in that if you're going to have an infusion reaction, it typically occurs at the first infusion, but that it seems to have those infusion reactions at a much higher frequency. And the efficacy data here is hard to judge, but it certainly seems like there's some activity, uh, and the question is uh, whether that's enough to uh, whether the safety uh, safety efficacy ratio is enough to uh, lead to further development of this agent. Now, I'm next going to switch to a discussion of antibodies directed against uh, transmembrane BAF and BLIS. And shown here is a T cell in the upper panel, and on the right hand side of the panel, uh, where you can see BAF and uh, you can see BAF, you see BAF is a brown molecule that's transmembrane, as well as released as a soluble form, and which can bind to two different receptors on B cells and mediate B cell growth and survival, as we as well as uh, 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 hyperactivity. And what, what we're going to talk about is an antibody that doesn't just react with soluble BAF, which is bulimumab, but an antibody that reacts with both soluble and transmembrane BAF. In addition, we're going to talk later on about an antibody directed against IL-17, which is produced by a T cell subset that activates B cells and many other cell types in promoting uh, the inflammation and rheumatoid arthritis. But first, let's talk about the LY212739 compound, which is a, a anti-transmembrane BAF that was tried in methotrexate inadequate responder rheumatoid arthritis. With monthly sub-Q injections and a dose uh, ranging um, from 1 milligram up to 120 milligrams, and there were placebo injections. And these were given, and the plus, and you can see the ACR20, ACR20s, the ACR50s, and the DAS28s. And what you can see, I think if you first go over to the far right-hand column, the delta DAS28 is how much did the DAS improve? It looks like there's a relatively flat dose-response curve, or there's no dose-response curve at all, meaning the placebo is very little different over a range of concentrations from 1 milligram up to 60 milligrams is no different, or really no different from the placebo, and maybe at 120 milligrams there is a little bit more activity. This is somewhat echoed or somewhat uh, echoed in the uh, ACR 20s and 50s, although the numbers do seem to be bouncing around, such as the 60 milligram ACR 50 response rate is 8%, where it was a 33% in the 10 milligram response rate, uh, 10, uh, 10 milligram dosing. So it's, it's not really clear whether the maximally effective dose has been reached or whether the drug is not that active. Uh, you really can't tell from this data. One point is that there were no major safety signals and the, the injection was uh, relatively well tolerated. 
Now I'm going to talk about IL-17 targeting in rheumatoid arthritis. And IL-17 is a many different molecules, uh, and there are many different isoforms. But in this study, we're going to talk about inhibition of IL-17A using an antibody uh, called secukinumab. And this was studied in a randomized controlled double-blind study in 237 patients who were a methotrexate inadequate responders. The drug was given by placebo and uh, given by subcutaneous injection. And the data shown here is going to be the ACR20, the, the DAS28 based on the CRP, and the ACR20 again is going to be shown as data at 12 weeks because the previous two columns, the ACR20 that I'm talking about here is going to be at 16 weeks, as is the Delta DAS CRP. We're going to compare these results between the placebo, the dosing at 75 milligrams, 150 milligrams, and 300 milligrams. What you can see is that the ACR20 uh, at the placebo arm at, 60, at 16 weeks was 36%. It was 47% at 75 milligrams, 47% at 150 milligrams, and 54% at 300 milligrams. The delta DAS went up from 0.81 and the placebo to 1.3 and stayed relatively flat at the 16-week time points. So in other words, it looks also very similar in that it's a very similar flat dose response curve with very modest improvement. Now, one of the problems is that with the 16-week data is that the difference, the ACR20 between the placebo arm and this, uh, the various uh, dosing strats, uh, doses of secukinumab is that there is no significant difference. At 12 weeks, however, shown in the far right-hand column, a significant difference was seen, and what really seemed to stand out was that the placebo arm at 16 weeks, when it was assessed, went up tremendously, uh, being at 22% at 12 weeks to 36% at uh, 16 weeks, and that increase seemed to have wiped out the uh, clinical benefit. There was no, again, the drug was well tolerated, and there were no significant uh, significant differences or SAEs across groups. So the take-home uh, points from uh, these trials is that the safety profile of rituximab has been maintained both in long-term clinical extension as well as in a unique population of patients with bad lung disease. And the, I think the conclusion from the uh, novel B and T cell targeting agents, whether it's ofatumumab or the anti-transmembrane uh, BAF uh, and soluble BAF versus the secukinumab, the anti-IL-17A, that I think the data is really too soon to tell whether these are going to uh, exhibit enough efficacy, and say, uh, enough efficacy in rheumatoid arthritis that would prompt our use and the further development or whether it will be used in some other disease state. So I'd like to thank you all for your time. I encourage you to participate in more rheumatology highlight reports online. And shown here is a list of the various people that will be that are available for you to see. And thank you very much.